Are you a real estate investor looking to sharpen your skills or a newbie looking to become one? You're in the right place. Welcome to Where Should I Invest? Real Estate Investing in Canada with your host, Sarah Larby. Dean heard it, heard it. Back to Where Should I Invest? How are you doing? Not too bad. How are you doing, Sarah? Good, good. You've been on a few times and, uh, you know, now it's, uh, I think maybe it's your third time or fourth time, perhaps. <laughs> Uh, I think this might be the fourth. Okay. All right. Awesome. Yeah. So we, you know, we've talked a lot about cottages in the past and uh, short-term rentals, recreational rentals, all that good stuff. And, uh, you know, some of the burrs that you, you were doing. Um, but, you know, before we, we started recording, we were talking about pivoting and some of the things that you're doing different now uh, with the economy, with the rates. And I think this is going to be a good topic for today's show. So, but before we get started, for anybody that hasn't met you or know about you let's do a quick overview of like who you are okay sounds good sarah so i've been a real estate investor for almost 30 years now uh i really got my start was with short-term vacation rentals i owned some cottages that i rented out on a short-term basis i started a management company and started looking after other people's rentals for them i had to pivot at that time uh, most of my properties were in a township, which ended up banning short-term rentals. So I had to uh, pivot and get into, you know, I ended up selling those properties. And when I sold those properties, I didn't really enjoy managing the properties for other people when my properties weren't a part of that management stable. I found it very stressful worrying about other people's properties and making sure that they were being taken care of. So I ended up selling the property there and, and of course, or sorry, selling the management company. And then I had to pivot and get into something else, right? So I kind of took a shotgun approach and I got into a little bit of everything. So since that time, I've gotten into student rentals. I have uh, a fourplex. I've gotten into duplex conversions, bought a condo on speculation. Uh, we have a small piece of land in Paraguay. We have a, a short-term rental in Orlando, Florida. So I... You know, a lot of people and a lot of other investors I know, they want to focus on a certain area and I, and I think that's great, but I think that in changing times, uh, an investor has to be adaptable and be able to pivot. Um, Sarah, if I can use you for an example, I've been following you for quite some time and I know that, uh, you were very big into the burst strategy and likely still are, but now I noticed that you've pivoted a little bit into midterm rentals and you've got some short-term rentals with your amazing resort there as well. So. Uh, I think an investor has to be able to adapt as times change. And, um, yeah, so that's a little bit of my history anyway, where I've come from. And, uh, now I'm working as a real estate agent here in the city of Guelph. I look after investors, primarily anything within a two hour radius of Guelph. And so, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that I'm sharing today is not only the advice that I use for myself, for my own investments, but the advice that I share with clients that I work with as well. Awesome. I, I think we're going to talk a lot about pivoting, but before we really dive into it, you know, you are a realtor and you've been a realtor, I think for a while, and, and you're working mostly with investors. Are you seeing them waiting right now or are people not buying? Like, what are you seeing in, in your market? I guess the, you know, the, the areas that you do cover. Yeah. Uh, so what a change, what a shift in the last few years, right? So we saw with COVID, everybody was rushing, trying to get into properties. Everybody was of trying to outbid each other. We saw crazy bidding wars on ridiculous properties that were cash flow negative, uh, that would never be a great investment. People just wanted to get into a, a house at any cost. Uh, now with the interest rate changes, uh, we've seen interest rates slowly going up the last two interest rate announcements they've held still where they are. Uh, but a lot of people are sitting back on the sidelines and waiting and the fundamentals have not changed. We're still seeing uh, higher than ever immigration numbers coming into, into Canada. The bulk of those people end up in the Toronto area and everything radiates out from Toronto. So while the fundamentals are still there, we do not have enough housing. Everybody's holding back. And as soon as we start to see the interest rates come down again, I think the, we're going to see the same thing we saw a couple of years ago. People will flood back into the market. And, uh, we'll start to drive those prices up again. So my opinion, and nobody has a crystal ball, obviously nobody knows with hundred percent certainty, but if you do believe that the interest rates are going to start heading back down again, then now is the time to purchase a property because you're, you're having a little bit of short-term pain at the higher interest rates that we're seeing now, 
And if you do believe that they're going to start coming down again, you'll take advantage in the next coming years of the lower interest rates while the price of the houses start to go up and you get that forced appreciation on your property. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it is interesting because I, I think, you know, a lot of homeowners probably are now starting to come back. We're seeing it in many markets from my conversations with realtors. I'm guessing that's, you know, maybe it's similar in, in your case, but I still think there's a lot of investors that are still just kind of waiting, waiting to see what happens. But um, I do agree with you as rates come down, prices are going to come back up. So, you know, it's just a matter yeah. of how, you know, like when and, and how long is it going to take and, and all that good stuff. But yeah, you know, that I have so many people that right now they, they, they want me to keep sending them listings and they, they yeah. got an eye on it. But as soon as the interest rates start to go down, I know they're going to be excited to get back in, but so is everybody. They're going to end up competing yeah. against each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then they're going to have missed that spot. Like, you know, I, I want to say back in like 2020, even 2019, 2020, 20, everybody was waiting for a time where they could make offers conditional on things, on yeah. anything. Right. And they didn't have to go all cash uh, and start negotiating. And, you know, and, and I believe this is going to be a short window. Is it going to be another year? Is it going to be six months? I don't know. Is it going to be a year and a half? I, I really don't know. But I think we do have a short window for sure. Yeah. Uh, but I but I do agree. And I want to go back to your pivoting piece because I've, I've been doing a lot of it and I'm still figuring out exactly, you know, is there any other pivot points? Uh, and I think that's always a, a work in progress. But I've pivoted a lot of my strategies, like you mentioned, right? The burrs, the burrs don't work anymore on singles and duplexes. They probably now start working on four units, uh, three or four units, and, and maybe not even three, depending on the area. So with the rates that we're at, however, when they do come down, the cash flow is going to be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Rinse rates come down, um, you know, like the midterm piece, right? The midterm piece has been a, been a big one for me in the last few years, uh, even more so now as, as the bylaws come into play. Uh, and the LTB, to be honest, and the RTA, I think are actually getting, in my opinion, they're getting worse and worse uh, as, as we go on. So um, what are some of the things that you, like you mentioned, you're buying, you know, obviously uh, a little bit off uh, offshore. Um, you're doing some student rentals. What are like, maybe just, just talk about some of those ways that you're pivoting and then maybe, you know, let's dive into each segment a little bit more. Absolutely. So I think with my recommendations to my, my clients and friends that are, that are investors are, you have to invest where the numbers make sense. And in these changing, trying times, we have to be able to pivot. So where can we make money right now in real estate investing? So we need to have high cash flow. There's a big push and there's a big shortage right now of student rentals. So yes, it's going to be a higher amount of work, a little bit more work involved in dealing with student rentals, but a little bit more cash flow can be made. There are cities that are charging a thousand dollars a bedroom right now. Uh, for student rentals. So I think that that's a way to get in and make and have a cash flowing property, uh, rooming houses. So there's a big push right now. When I say student rentals, that's one product, but there's also another product for individuals that aren't students that are young professionals that are looking to, uh, get affordable rental housing and they're willing to share the house with other people in the home. Now, of course, you're going to want to check with you, your municipality to make sure what they allow as far as, as uh, rooming houses. But don't always think student rentals when you're thinking about renting out by the bedroom. Uh, there is a real market out there for a young professional to just have a parking space, have one bedroom. Everybody's ordering out now. Nobody's even really using their kitchen very much. Uh, so I think that's a way to, to, uh, to get into the market. And also if it doesn't, uh, if there's nothing available in your area, look outside of your area. Uh, there's still opportunities in different states in the United States. Uh, there's opportunities outside of North America. I'm not as familiar with those areas, of course, but, uh, don't always settle for your own area. If there's other areas that make sense with full management, that they can keep an eye on your property and look after your property, maybe that's where the opportunities lie for now. Yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting because like student rentals, so let's just take each one and, and I want to dig into them a little bit, but student rentals were very saturated for a long time. Um, and then, and then the pandemic happened and then all the students went back and like lived at home or, you know, then they went remote and then a lot of investors sold their student rentals or converted them to regular rentals. And now there's actually the opposite effect, right? Now we're like, we're seeing a shortage. Um, and so can you maybe like share, I know like you're like more in the Guelph KWC area, but like what you were seeing in terms of like, you know, what is the current um, price per bedroom right now, what you're seeing and where it was before, 
um because i'm sure there is quite a big of a, a you know transition gap oh absolutely so uh guelph kitchener cambridge waterloo area uh you know it would be normal in time in year a few years ago not not even that many years ago for a bedroom to rent for between six seven hundred and fifty dollars a bedroom uh right now the bedrooms are getting anywhere between 900 for a very basic small bedroom, $900 all the way up to, yeah, I've heard as high as 1350. If you have a super large bedroom with an ensuite, and, you know, some close by amenities, uh, you can pretty much name your price. So, uh, you can imagine if you have four or five, six bedrooms, and again, check with each municipality to make sure that they'll allow for that many, but, uh, you know, with that many number of bedrooms, it might be worth a little bit of extra headaches that you might have to deal with, with students. Uh, to get that kind of cash flow. So yeah, the student rentals. One other one I didn't mention too is the short term rental thing too, Sarah. So, I, and I'm sure we'll touch upon that, but that looking, we got to look for ways for high cash flow. And that's another opportunity is in the short term rental market. Yeah, for sure. I, I love that. I love that market as well. I mean, I, I do find that it's a little bit more saturated these days than it used to be. I mean, well, you, you know, you likely know as well, you used to manage many of them and and times that have changed, I think people are are definitely tightening their purse strings and not spending as much and, and you know, really trying to figure out, like, how much disposable income they have towards recreational types of properties or traveling. And, you know, and, and we're seeing the effects of that, I think, in, in 2023, where people are not, like, cottages that I have, as an example, like, I used to get a lot more. Um, and yeah. I used to, like, we, I think we talked a little bit about it before we started recording is... Um, by now, most of the summer would have been booked, right? And I don't want to reduce my pricing too much. Like I still do want to have a strategy where I'll hold off and, and and likely now I'm starting to see some bookings. But, you know, during the pandemic, and I've had my cottage, you know, a couple cottages even prior to that. But, um, you know, during the pandemic, I mean, everything was booked up. You had one day or two days, it was booked up regardless. But even before that, like in 2019, 2018, and I was still in the game at that point in time too, I think, um, you know, by March, likely your summer would have started being booked. Uh, if not, if not full by then. And I think during the pandemic, it was like November, the summer was full for next summer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think that's, that's saturated. So, okay. So student rentals, I think are a good thing. Um, from a student rental, are you seeing what, like, what are you seeing? Nine month, 12 month leases? Are you seeing utilities being included? Like, are you seeing anything that you could share with us today of, of how to best set them up? Yep. Certainly. I've, I've seen, you know, everything that you had mentioned and everything in between with my client. But what I recommend to them is if you can get one person named on the lease, when a group comes in, rent it to the group with one person on the lease and have, uh, utilities as part, sorry, not the landlord paying for them, but the, the, the tenants have to assume the, the utilities as well. Uh, that's the way to go. You're going to, it's going to be the most cash flow and the least amount of headaches for you to worry about as well. If you're as the landlord, if you're looking after the utilities, uh, you're going to find that they just really don't care leaving lights on all the time. They're inviting friends over to do their laundry at their place, that sort of thing. So if at all possible, you want to make sure that they're looking after the utilities as well. Yeah. And like, without saying, you know, like something that's wrong here, I think mm -hmm. if you're on one lease, you could probably get away with a little bit more than usual. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. But there, sure. from, you know, from, from, I guess, like a maximum number of potential bedrooms or individual leases and also possibly from a financing standpoint, right? Potentially. Yeah. No, we've got, absolutely. So. Yeah. Just talk, talk to your professionals on, on that, but I think there are definitely some benefits to that. And, um, and you know, the other thing that you said that I thought was really interesting because, um, rooming houses you know, you have this vision in your mind that it's like, you know, the bottom of the, I shouldn't say this, but like the, the ones that can barely afford anything. Um, yeah. but I think, I think it's pivoting now because of where everything is. We're just, it's just so expensive everywhere that young professionals that, um, you know, you might want to actually rent to, but their budget might be a thousand dollars a month instead of, I don't know, $2,000 a month and maybe three of them together. Uh, yeah. you know, can essentially be on a lease. And I was just um, talking to somebody at one of my gyms recently, and she just came to this country uh, and she is uh, rooming or you, like, you know, renting a house with two other uh, tenants. Um, one is a nurse and one works at like Scotiabank. Uh, yeah. She is like a BCIN designer anyways. So the three of them are each essentially paying for this lease and it's on under one person. And I think that there is some some opportunity there likely to cater to some different types uh, of individuals that can still be great, great tenants, 
um, not students and not likely lifer tenants because they're my 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 you know the way I look at it in Ontario is you don't want unfortunately tenants forever because yeah you're you're going to be stuck holding a you know a lease with uh, with a lack of upside um, yeah it's you know a lot of those those tenants will probably you know move on find something else down the road um, and I think there's some good opportunity there um, maybe just share a little bit of what your thoughts are on these didn't these I don't know if you want to call them rooming houses or maybe you have a different name for them um, but it it is a different concept that's not like the typical rooming house of like people that you might see on disability, not that there's anything wrong with that or welfare or whatnot. Well, I'll give you an example. So we, we run a, a small meetup group in, in wealth, the, the great, we call it the great meetup group. So it's wealth real estate acquisitions team is what it stands for. And it's basically just a, a meetup where we get together every couple of months to talk about real estate investing. Uh, but at our recent meeting, we actually had an individual there who has bought a rooming house and they have marketed to mature adults. So we're talking widowers, uh, people that are, you know, they're way too young and active to end up in a retirement home, but they're on their own now. And, uh, so they have an upscale rooming home where they have marketed to these people. And I think they only had four bedrooms, but anyways. Uh, rented out four separate bedrooms. I'm not sure what the amounts were, but they kind of indicated that the cash flow was very good. And I thought, wow, isn't that really neat? And I think that's likely a trend that we're going to see moving forward as we see, you know, housing intensification. We see municipalities are starting to embrace the intensification within their municipalities. So I think we're we're starting to see rules open up a little bit on rooming houses and and uh, multiple units within a dwelling. And, uh, what a neat market that would be to just kind of cater to the, to the older demographic that, you know, they're going to take great care of your home. You had mentioned Sarah, uh, that, you know, you, you don't love having super young people there cause they might be there, or maybe if they're so young that they're going to start their family and move off, that's fine. That's great. But mm -hmm. you don't want somebody there that might be there 20 years. Well, if you're appealing to that mature audience, you know, they're not likely to be there 20 years either. And they're very likely to take really good care of the home for you. So, uh, mm -hmm. I, you know, that's kind of an interesting pivot point, you know, a way to, to start to look to cash flow and a different way to get into real estate investing as well. Yeah, no, I, I think, I think that's where, you know, the creative strategic sides come out, right? When you, when you have to do something and you've got to either, you know, pivot on your rental strategy, or you've got to pivot on your acquisition and actual real estate investing strategy. Um, or a combination of both. And, and I think that that's likely where it's going to be. I also had a conversation recently uh, with a student of mine about, you know, like exactly what you said in terms of like something for older adults, but really creating um, accessibility and mobility opportunities, right? Or maybe there's, um, so if they're in a wheelchair, or like, so you're creating something and you're retrofitting it in order to be able to be accessible and, and mobile. Um, and I think you could probably get more rents for that as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, it's an interesting place. Uh, you know, I don't have a lot of experience myself personally looking into that, but my, my ears perked up when I heard them talking about it. I mm -hmm. Yeah, I know it, it definitely is interesting. So, so you've also pivoted out of country, uh, yeah. you mentioned Florida, you've men mentioned some land. Um, why, why, and what are you doing? So again, in a nutshell, I just think you got to invest where the numbers make sense, right? So I got looking into the Florida market, the short-term rental market down there. Uh, I started to look at some of the coastal cities. I uh, got a little bit worried about the whole hurricane thing and, and um, I'm hearing hurricane insurance is going up for those proper properties. So I, I got looking at Orlando with the theme parks, you know, appealing to the families down there. Uh, and, you know, I could have a whole hours long conversation with how I think somebody should go about buying a remote property. Uh, cause I've done that a few times now and I've, I've investigated a few other cities and countries, uh, where I didn't end up buying. And I think there really is an order of things and I'll just briefly go over it. I think when you go down there, the first person you should be meeting with is a management company down there. And if you can meet with them face to face, that's even better because then they have a great idea of what properties are going to cash flow because they have a stable of properties and they know exactly what communities are bringing what amounts of money in. Mm -hmm. So with that information, then you're going to a realtor, somebody who knows short-term rentals, if that's what you're looking for, and which was my case, 
you look for the realtor in that area that knows short-term rentals and you're focusing on the areas that you know that your chosen management company is going to be able to look after. So anyway, I'm kind of getting off topic a little bit, but when I no, went down there, insight, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I, I met with a manager down there. He seen, and I met with a few managers. It wasn't just the one. That I, so I met with a few, I ended up selecting one. He showed me real comparables for the type of property and the price point that I was looking to buy in. Uh, with that information, we found a realtor, ended up finding a property and and it's been going great. Uh, the manager's been filling the property. He looks after everything. I'm kind of at a, a point in my life, Sarah, where I'm looking for very passive uh, investments at the likes at the management company. The, I heard from him twice last year. One time was my pool pump died and one time my air conditioner died. Any other smaller issues, he, they just take care of it and it's and it's done. So it, it's been fantastic. Amazing. Yeah, I'm assuming they have like a threshold, right? So if it goes over a certain threshold in terms of like what you have to spend, then they'll give you a heads up and then below that they, you know, maybe it's a thousand bucks or whatever that, that looks like that based on your contract. That's exactly right. So anything over $400, they'll reach out to me. And I know my, and my assumption as well was, oh yeah, okay. Now all of a sudden I'm going to see all kinds of bills coming in at 350 that they mm, just had to go on to. Interesting. But no, you know, it's okay. been great. Uh, even, you know, little things like the stove stopped working, they've gone in and I, and fixed it and I get a bill, it shows in my, uh, in my uh, statement for the month, $25 charge for their handyman to go in and take care of it. Around here, if you had an appliance That's person come out, it's going to be $150, right? At to least. start. <laughs> yeah. you, they uh, they bill so, you for like an hour automatically or two and then, and then plus, right? Exactly. Exactly. And things like four new bath towels, $30, you know? And so I know, I know I'm not getting gouged and that is something you got to watch out for because you're going to have great managers and you might have some that, that are a little bit shady. So again, that's why I said, if you can meet with them face to face, you go down there, you do your investigation, looking around, meeting with realtors, and uh, that's the best way to get, get a good sense of whether they're going to be a good match for you or not. Yeah. And I, I think too, like, just as a recommendation, like if you know other investors that have done it, like see if see if you can utilize or or get connected to their team as well. So rather than like for example, somebody finding their own team by themselves and then you know trial and error, maybe finding somebody like you that's if they want to go into Orlando and be like, hey, who did you work with, and see if you yeah. can get some references that way or whatnot. So I mean, it's just a lot easier to kind of you know just like. If you, you're starting off, you know, in Guelph, for example, like you would go to other investors and who do they use? Like, you know, hey, I use Dean Curtis for, you know, the KWC area as an example. So like, it's just, it, it's just good to get references from other investors that are doing it rather than trying to figure it out, you know, from scratch. Absolutely. It's, it's a small community and we're, we're all at the same meetup events. We're all listening to the same podcasts. We're all, we, we know we know about each other and I'm happy to share information. If I don't have the answers, then I'm always quick to point them in the direction of the person that's going to best be able to help. Mm -hmm, for sure. So you're, you bought some land. What are you going to do with the land? So, well, there's a small chunk of land that we bought in Paraguay actually, and it's, it's part of an orange plantation. So it's uh, a syndication down there where they sell individual one acre lots in a larger, uh, agricultural land per purchase. So again, I had mentioned now at the stage that I'm in right now, looking to get more passive, uh, we have one share, which is one acre of this. And we just receive the income from the oranges that are sold yearly. So that, that was just the small purchase I made there, but we recently went to Italy, had a look around in Italy, uh, in the end decided it wasn't for me, but I was there with another investor that I think they are going to go ahead and push forward. Same principles uh, apply there. We sat and met with property managers. We met with realtors in the area, looked at them face to face. Great excuse to go for a trip. And it's going to be a write off against it's a research uh, towards your future investment. So check with your accountant, of course. But, but yeah, it's uh, so I've gone and had a look there. Um, we've been to Belize. Belize is on my radar right now, and Costa Rica is on my radar right now. So those are two different spots that I think we might end up pulling the trigger on in the future. I really like the idea for my next purchase to be in a location where we can get residency as well, as long as we're purchasing over a certain amount. Uh, and, it, and that amount will differ depending on what country you're looking in. But I think the, those are the next two that are, that are going to be on our radar. Yeah. It's, it's funny because Matt and I were having this conversation and, and we continue. It's just, and I don't want to get political, but if this government comes back, 
<laughs> and gets voted for another four years. We are out of here. So I, I'm with you. I'm with you. It's, it's, uh, it's insane. But, you know, aside from that, um, it, I think like, just like you're saying, you want to start the process now because who knows what's going to happen and how this country is going to look like, you know, unfortunately, if, uh, if Trudeau and the liberals get back into power, because clearly they have their own agenda, uh, and it is not, uh, you know, super investor friendly or, uh, entrepreneur or business minded people friendly. I agree with you a hundred percent, Sarah. Absolutely. So it, it is funny because we're like, okay, let's, let's talk about residency and then different locations and who's where, <laughs> uh, and yeah. I still think Ontario has some, some great upside. Um, but you know, you can invest here, but you could also plan your exit if you need to plan your exit. <laughs> Absolutely. That's right. Yeah. Are you, are you seeing a lot of investors? I mean, obviously you've got your meetups and, and your, your group and your connections and you're well connected. Are you seeing a lot of people? on that same kind of train of saying, okay, well, you know, I'm going to start looking elsewhere out of the country. Like, are you seeing can Canada lose investors to potentially, you know, anywhere out of country? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So it's, it's a big trend right now is people starting to let it started. Uh, you know, I don't want to say it started. I mean, people always were, were open to investing outside of Ontario and outside of Canada, but we really saw an up uptick with, with COVID, uh, all of the, uh, regulation and the shutdowns that we had during that time. Uh, and now it's really opened the eyes to investors. And of course, with the problems with the landlord tenant board, residential tenancies act in Ontario, you know, people really are starting to get sick of being handcuffed and not being, being able to do what they want to do with their own rental property. Uh, so we've really seen an uptick of people starting to look outside of the province. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And hopefully, you know, hopefully the politicians, they wake up and they realize they're pushing a lot of people out by creating so much red tape. I mean, look at even with what they're doing with a lot of Airbnbs and, you know, I mean, it happened to you and where were you? Is it tiny township? Uh, it? Seguin, Seguin township, close to Perry yeah. South. Okay. And I think, you know, I mean, they're all, they're all, they're all going to start coming down at some point, whether it's, you know completely like banning them in some areas or it has to be your primary residence like Hamilton June 1st it's going to have to be your primary residence for short term you know but like I, I think it's just a it's a way for them to get votes in my opinion but b is it really going to like put a ton of stock back into the long-term market which is what they want to do and I don't think so I think most investors are fed up with the RTA and the LTV right now that they just maybe don't want to take the risk for the time being and there's nothing wrong with that like you know, by forcing us with sticks rather than carrots, then this is what happens. And I think a lot of people are starting to go elsewhere at this point. Yeah. So in those short-term rental markets, especially the Seagram Township, um, you know, that it's not, definitely not going to add to the long-term housing uh, supply. They're, they're short-term homes. I think they just, they panicked and they don't know how to handle uh, having all of these short-term rentals and, and people coming up. I, I do think that they're starting to pivot themselves a little bit, these townships for the most part. Seguin Township, it was a couple of years ago, they outright banned it. I now understand that they're at least investigating the possibility of having a licensing system. Uh, I do still have a short-term cottage rental, but it's on the Bruce Peninsula, Northern Bruce Township. They do have a licensing program. So I think that's the way to go. I think there's a way to make both sides happy where you can still rent out your property, but you can make sure that you're doing it in a responsible manner, being respectful of the neighbors. And you're not just throwing 300 people into a property for a one night party. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants that. And of course, that's the worst case image that every township thinks that you're going to be doing with the property. Uh, and I, I firmly believe with the townships, when you have a licensing system in place, it's going to bring tourism to your area. It's going to increase uh, the employment because you're hiring cleaners and handymen to look after your property. They're going to have to frequent your gas stations, your grocery stores, things like that. So it's going to bring money into the economy. And for you, the investor, the benefit is I think it increases the value of your property. If you buy a rental property and you have neighbors beside you and it's not really sure if it's allowed or not, uh, they're getting all upset. But now let's imagine that that is a licensed and legal rental property where you can now sell it and, and also include, listen, this is the, uh, the guests that we have had for the last three years. These are the amounts that we've charged it. And we have followed all of the municipalities rules. Uh, it is a licensed and legal property. I think there's a lot of value in that for resale when down the road, if you do want to move out of that and somebody else wants to come in. 
So hopefully, mm-hmm. hopefully we'll see these, uh, these communities, municipalities and townships, hopefully we'll see them start to go to some sort of a licensing system. Yeah. And I think for like small business owners and tourism too, like if you just straight out ban it, I mean, you're stifling that opportunity for that, those people that are in those regions working, uh, small businesses, business owners, restaurants, like, you know, that helps them a lot. And, um, you know, I I think the Kawartha is, is big on tourism and I think they're looking at talk, you know, they've, they're in talks anyways, there's surveys that are going out about doing some licensing. I can't see it being completely banned. Uh, but I definitely think there's something, something coming. Which is okay. And I do agree with you. Yeah. Like, you know, I don't want to party in my house either. Like, I don't think anyone wants to party in their house <laughs> regardless. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's got to be a win-win for everybody. And, and ultimately, like, here's, here's how I look at it is investors are uh, insightful. Investors are resourceful. And um, they'll find a way. Uh, and if it's not in that township and not in that province or not in this country, they still ha- know how to find money and bring money and, and get money and, and make money, make money. And they're just going to do it elsewhere. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, look, it, it is what it is. Like, I think I'm still personally invested in Ontario. I'm just being a little bit more cautious and extra cautious on uh, the tenants and not only tenant screening, but just the type of tenants and how long I believe that they're actually going to stay and how easy it's going to be for them to find another house if that property, I don't know, I deem it that I want to sell it to, to buy something else as an example. Because t- on top of tenant screening, it's like, are these tenants going to potentially easily be able to find another place? Or are they going to buy their place down the road? Or are they going to be tenants for many, many years? And I don't know if I want tenants for many, many years because of all the problems in the system right now. So my tenants are going to be highly screened, which they already are, but even more so now to make sure that they are going to be uh, marketable to other landlords. <laughs> well, and it, isn't it sad that we have to be careful like that, Sarah? I mean, mm-hmm. if, if we had a system where you could actually, which was good for the tenants and for the landlords, we have a system right now that punishes the landlords. And if you are straddled with a tenant who d- decides, a professional tenant who decides I'm not going to pay rent from day one, we're in a system where it can take eight to nine, maybe up to a year before you can get resolution and get them uh, out of the house. I just read an article today. Uh, I believe it's in Stony Creek. Uh, it was online on their paper. Uh, and it was a couple is now trying to sue the, uh, the government because of the Ontario landlord tenant board, because they have lost their rental property and they had to sell their home because they had long-term professional tenants. And there was, you know, there was nothing that they could do. They were following the rules that were given to them and there was nothing that they can do to get them evicted. Now, I don't know if they're going to go get, get anywhere with this. But thank God that there's organizations around and there's actually people trying to push to make some changes to, to, to make the system better. Now let's imagine for a minute that the landlord tenant board, uh, had rules in place where if a tenant was just a professional tenant and decided not to pay you rent, that you could have them out in two to three months. And, and I'm not talking about anybody good paying tenants. I don't want landlords to just be able to walk in and kick those people out. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the people that are abusing the system. Now, if we all knew that the landlord tenant board had our back, if they weren't paying rent, how many more people, investors would come into the market and supply housing? How Mm -hmm. many more people would put a secondary rental unit into their home? This is the problem is there's a shortage right now in housing and it's because nobody, there's a lot of people are scared of becoming landlords. I talk to these people all the time, every day. And, and you see in a lot of the Southern states, landlord friendly, friendly states, vacancies are actually quite a bit higher. And why are they higher? It's because that there's actually supply and demand. There's lots of housing available. And if you have a bed at tenant, you can move them out. And so there's tons of vacancy. It would, it would increase the housing supply. Um, but we just have to be vocal as landlords. We have to group together. We have to make sure that, uh, we keep notifying our politicians and uh try and make the the change and i think as i said i think it will benefit tenants as well in the long run if we fix the system yeah no exactly and and then like you said it's supply and demand and right now there is like 
barely any supply and there's a ton of demand and there's a ton of demand more with all the new immigration that's coming in, which is fine. But like, I just don't even know how we're going to house everybody that's coming in. Um, we're already in a housing crisis. It's not going to get any better, I think, anyways, for the next five years. So, you know, why don't you, like, I do agree with you, incentivize the landlords, fix the system a little bit. And like, it's not just this province. I think it's like different parts of the country. You know, I don't think it, Quebec is any, any better. I don't think Vancouver, BC is, is much better necessarily either. But like, that's where a lot of immigrants are moving to, right? Is Montreal or Toronto, GTA, Vancouver. So like, it's ironic, but like, I mean, I don't know. Like, I think a lot of people now are saying, okay, well, I could invest in Ontario and I still think it's good because I think there's still some upside. I think the upside is better in places like Ontario versus like, I don't know, Alberta. That's just my, my, my take. I think the upside yeah. in the long term is better for wealth creation, but I think the tenant risk is much higher. So this is why the midterm, the short term, the, um, you know, student rental probably at that point in time as well is going to be a pivot point for many people, um, recreational, um, or just being extremely diligent on the tenant screening, um, even more so than, than, you know, people were doing it last, you know, couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. I you just have to be careful. And at the end of the day, you're still taking a risk. I'm dealing right now, one of my rental properties, a great young family. Uh, they made their payments for three straight years on time, no problem. And then during COVID, uh, they ended up losing their job. I, there might've been, I think there were some other issues going on with the family as well, but, uh, yeah, payments ended up stopping and we're right now going through the process, eviction process. So screening you, you want to lessen your chances of having a problem you can never 100 percent guarantee it because you know life changes circumstances change but really i it, hey listen when I, I told you i've been doing this for 30 years i can remember some of my first rental properties sarah they showed up with cash in hand i barely <laughs> knew their last name they got to yeah. rent the place no problem and yeah. wow but things ever changed oh it's changed so much and i think even beforehand like it was easier if you sold a property or you needed to move into one of your rentals as an example because the difference between what people were paying versus where what they could find just by moving wasn't as steep like yeah. and when you look at the last like three years of increases like that's just insane and so now you've got a lot of tenants that are like paying i don't know let's just call it two grand a month but maybe that same comp today is four. So now they're doubling and they might've just moved, I don't know, three years ago. And it's, they're yeah. that far behind because of the market increases, but that's a supply and demand thing. And it's not going to work any better by restricting landlords even more. I think it's incentivizing landlords to be able to, you know, create more housing. And then this is going to, I think, naturally help stabilize the market. But right now it's just, it's a frenzy and who wants to lock? and this is why midterm and short term, like who wants to lock themselves in where there's only a 2.5% increase? Why That's would right. anyone do that when, when market rents are increasing 15 to 20% and everything else and all the other costs are increasing drastically as well. And it, to, if I can get on my soapbox again, one quick <laughs> sec. So why are the rental prices so high? It's because there's just not enough housing available. And if you make it easier for the landlords and we start just, we start increasing the amount of rental supply that's out there, it will help to bring those prices back down again. We just don't have enough supply and we don't have enough supply because the government gives no incentives for builders or for private citizens to create rental housing within their dwellings that they currently have. Mm -hmm, for sure. Now, if an investor, or a new in investor comes to you and they want to say, hey, help me invest, like what are some of the strategies that you're showing them and like what markets seem to work so well for on your end? Absolutely. So I pride myself on, on making sure that we point them in the direction that's going to be best for them and the investments that they're starting to look for. So if that ends, if that means working with me to buy something in the area, great. If it means that they, sh what might be best for them is to go somewhere else, I'm going to help point them in the right direction. And, and that some of the things we already talked about, whether it means buying in Florida, buying somewhere else. Now, as far as areas around here, um, Again, for a young individual who's looking to put in the work, wants the cash flow, and I think that's the way you have to go right now in this kind of a market. Uh, we would be looking at anything that would be good, be a good student rental in the Kitchener, Guelph, Cambridge area. Uh, we would be looking at short-term rentals. I'm still 
promoting that. I think there's still money to be made there. I, you're right. Uh, there is a lot of competition right now, but you just have to make sure that you've got something that sets yourself apart from the competition. Uh, you know, gone are the days where you just have kind of a shack by a river and, and believe me, you would rent the three years in advance, no problem. Uh, but now you've got to offer a few amenities and, and make sure they've got, you know, internet, all of that sort of thing. Uh, whereas three years ago, you could get away without having that. But those are the sort of things that I'm helping people with in, in my area, if they're looking to get into uh, real estate investing. Yeah, definitely. And I, and I still think those are, are great options and those are great markets. And this is a long-term play. This is a long-term game. And Yes, things are, you know, high right now and costly right now, but you'll be happy that you got in regardless at the end of the day in 10 years from now, you'll look back and, and you will be happy. Um, awesome. Dean, uh, thank you for being on the show. It was great having you on. Um, where can my listeners reach out and find out more? Well, it's always great chatting with you, Sarah. Uh, if you are looking to get a hold of me, you can uh, reach out through Instagram. I'm very active on Instagram, Dean Curtis Real Estate. Uh, you can also reach me by email and, uh, I, I guess I could add it to the notes there. It's kind of a long email address, but it's Dean at cbn.on.ca. That stands for Coldwell Banker Newman, cbn.on.ca. You'll be able to reach me there. Okay. And what's your final tip of, of advice, uh, and insight for 2023? Invest where the numbers make sense. And one quick thing I will add, you are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. I firmly believe in that quote. Uh, make an effort to get together with other like-minded people at least once a month. Uh, join your local meetup groups. Get talking to other people that are investing and that are doing what you want to be doing. Amazing. Thank you, Dean, for being on the show. And, uh, you know, I think you're probably one of the, the most uh, brought back guests. So... <laughs> Oh, I would <laughs> I love speaking with you, Sarah. I love talking real estate. I'd be happy to come back anytime. Awesome. Thanks so much. All right. You take care. Thanks so much for listening to Where Should I Invest with your host, Sarah Larby. Make sure to listen in next time. We'll catch you on the next episode of Where Should I Invest.